Hello and welcome to The Hearing, our music review show here on the channel. I'm John. And from Chicago's north side, I'm Scotto. And without any further ado, on to this week's album, which is from 2003, Parlor by Darling Violetta. Now, before I get into the bio, just a little disclaimer. Um, there is very little information about Darling Violetta online, so some of this is going to be coming from the nearly 16-year-old memories. I was active on the band's official forum when this album came out. Um, also, I'm a little unsure about some of the name pronunciation, so apologies if I get anything wrong. All right, on to the bio. Darling Violetta is, or possibly was, an American-slash-Mexican rock band based in Hollywood, California, who took their name from the salutation used by Bela Lugosi in letters to his mistress, Violetta Napierska. Mm. Uh, un unique for their use of cello in their music, and best known for composing and performing the opening theme to Buffy the Vampire Splinter spin-off Angel, as well as having uh, some of their music featured in Buffy and the and two of the Vampire the Masquerade games. The band released uh, two EPs, 97's Bathwater Flowers and 99's The Kill You EP, before releasing their only full album, 2003's Parlor. Uh, during the recording sessions for Parlor, bassist Addo Addy left the band to pursue a solo career, and following the supporting dates for the album, drummer Steve McManus left to pursue a career as a novelist. In, I want to say, late 03, early 04, there was a post on the forum uh, about some of the songs that the remaining members, uh, Cammy Ellen, Cammy Ellen and, and Jim Thomas, were working on uh, for their next release. And that was the last we heard from them until 2009, when they reported to, that they were working on songs for their fourth as-of-yet untitled release. And that was the last anyone heard from the band until January 6th of last year when, <laughs> when Cammy finally reported that Darling Violetta is on, quote, an extended hiatus. It's been 10 fucking years, man. <laughs> Darling, <laughs> DarlingViolletta.com is now up for sale. Um, yeah. <laughs> As far as I know, Addo is still the only one making music professionally. Um, his latest album, 24 Quadros, was released in 2014. Um, he's originally from Mexico, so all of his most, I think most, if not all of his solo stuff is in Spanish. Um, Steve has released two novels so far, both crime dramas, uh, Red Flag in 2015 and its sequel, Seven Devils in 2018. Cammy's Twitter bio says that she's now working as a love and lifestyle coach. Um, incidentally, I, I um, checked a, a short video she put out for a sub online seminar she does to get the pronunciation of her last name. I always pronounce it Ellen, which is why I messed it up slightly earlier. It's Ellen. Um, okay. and, and Jim's Twitter bio says that he's a poker fiend, LA Kings fan, and co-founder of Darling Violetta. Um, none of the other band members' bios mention Darling Violetta. Parlor, as I mentioned earlier, is the band's first and only full studio album. It was released on February 25th, 2020, oh, yeah, 2003. Yes, my 31st birthday. Produced by Lewis White and features Cammy Ellen on vocals, Jim Thomas on guitar, Steve McManus on drums, with additional musicians Chris Pott, Addo Eddy, and Michael Renninger on bass, Jerry Sudiak on cello, Brett Levick on background vocals, Steve Hooneman on horns, Brett Peel, Bren, ah, sorry, Ben Peeler on lap steel guitar and Lewis White on synthesizers. Reminder, I don't edit any songs into the episodes for copyright reasons, but down in the description and on our blog at johnscotto.com, you'll find links to the album on Spotify and YouTube. On to the tracks, and this one's going to be interesting because <laughs> there are several very short tracks, starting with number one, Star Shoe Box, or as it's called on Spotify and Amazon Intro. I ripped the CD over the weekend because um, I should mention I listened to this about a week ago because when I listened to the album on Spotify previously, there was a bit of a couple of songs missing. I, I listened to it to make sure it was all there and send you the link. And I and spoiling my review, I fell back in love with the album. And so I ripped the CD at very high quality. And all of the interludes have names that are only okay. that are only on the ripped if you that you can only get if you rip the CD. Honestly, I could have lived without all the intros and interludes. <laughs> yeah, they're they're odd and interesting. Um, this they, is just they take away from the flow of the album. They don't really add many. I think there's like one of them that's. I think like the second one is good. The one with or 
the one with all the horns at one time, just for mm. like a few seconds, was probably the most interesting one of all of them. It was really just, it was obviously just leftover, fo- you know, stuff well, that they didn't know what to do with, and they mm. just kind of put out there. This the first one, uh, Star Shoe Box, is the horn, cello, and synth part recorded as the for the pre-chorus of the last song, song Star Shoes, very Beatles influenced. I pointed out on their forum when it was released uh, that it sounds a lot like a guitar part from the song Spoiled and Rotten from the Kill You EP and asked if it was you know put in there to bridge the two releases. Jim Thomas replied saying that it wasn't intentional and he'd never noticed the similarity before I'd mentioned it. <laughs> so I pointed out something about something he wrote that he never got. Oh. <laughs> uh, it, it was, you know, um, um, similar rhythm and, and uh, chord, you know, the way the chord is for, uh, put together, um, and I think it ties ties the beginning and the end of the album nicely, to, nicely together. To have, yeah, you I know, hadn't thought of the ending album, but yeah, it does tie the, those together. You know, once you get the star shoes, it does tie it together nicely. But nothing um, else, like the interludes, just don't. No, they're just, all pretty pointless. It's just kind of like, huh? <laughs> uh, on to track two, the first full song, "A Smaller God," mm-hmm. and this is basically about uh, flirting with a guy, but uh, you know, the singer or the main character in the song flirting with a guy and then her int- intuition the smaller god kind of war- warning her off of him uh the chorus is i could have died last night but i heard the voice of a smaller god well and i mean this is definitely one of the stronger tracks on the album i mean her her voice just comes right out at you mm-hmm. a- as soon as you go there's no mistaking it's very it's very alanis morris set interesting it's um, like um which it was like one of her late '90s songs that were was yeah, kind of like it. like uninvited. I think was the name of that one where mm, it was very yeah. cashmere. The only one I really liked. Yeah, yeah, it was good. And I mean, yeah, yeah it's very yeah, similar to that. Um, love the nice simple in, uh, intro riff in the verse. Um, Jim Thomas, I, I was playing for about twenty years, playing guitar for about twenty years when I discovered Darling Violetta, and Jim Thomas was the first guitarist in a long time to really influence me. He just oh, has wow. this great kind of minimalist off kilter style where he doesn't play a note he doesn't have to. And the ones he chooses are really interesting. Um, you know, it's, it's, he doesn't take the conventional approach at all. Um, so it's this nice soft verse with this really simple riff. And then just this loud chorus just comes out of nowhere. Yeah. With this great wall of sound that's not just guitar, it's cello, it's right. some synthesizers. And then he doesn't really repeat the uh, guitar figure in the second verse. I, he, I like it when bands change it up in the second verse a little bit. Yeah. Um, and an interesting background vocal on the line, Learn to Live Again. It's this low vocal. Um, it's not I don't. It's not Jim, who occasionally sang backup live. Um, it could have been Cammy. I think it was probably Brett Levick, who sings backup on a later song. Um, and it's got just kind of this interesting Bowie kind of twi- sound to it. I was going to say, does he do that Bowie voice later in the album? Uh, on he's the, singing like The real this? low part? Yeah, that, that's Brett Levick. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, see, I never thought Bowie. Oh, we'll get to oh, it. Oh, yes. Right? So very much is. Um, I always thought Leonard Cohen, but we'll get to that. Um, <laughs> and then after, there's an actual guitar solo, which yeah. is unusual for Darling Violetta. There's like three on the album. But there's also this really nice soft bridge. They're great at dynamics. You know, yeah. they go kind of mid-tempo in the verse, real loud on the chorus, very soft for the bridge. Um, and the solo when he does the solos when he does play them are very nicely melodic. On two track three, brap. This is the brass piece that you were talking about. Yeah, this is the only interlude that that I uh, I'd keep. Uh, um, under where it, I put it, where it belongs. But... It's a brass band that starts out kind of normal sounding and then just yeah. goes rapidly just, off like, kilter into cacophony. You know, yeah, they kind of loop, loop it on itself when mm-hmm. they were, they were just them fucking around in the studio. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Oh, that sounds cool, but there's nothing, nothing we could do into a song. Right. So we'll have these interludes. <laughs> on to track four, Pauline, one of my favorites. Yeah, it was like, is this a cover? Because I could have sort of heard the lyrics before, but no, it's yeah. the original. Love had the drums come in in the beginning. Steve McManus is amazing. Um, his decision, I'm, I'm, I hope he's happy and fulfilled in his career as a writer, <laughs> but when, and this is applies to most of the band, um, his decision to stop making music professionally was a loss to music. He's one of my favorite drummers. Yeah. Oh yeah. He's fucking amazing on this. There's no question about it. And this I, whole album. Yeah. Yeah. 
and I love how kind of present but subtle the bass is. It doesn't stick out, but it's yeah. solidly there. Um, and it's basically about, um, I don't know if she's a starlet or just a woman who expects to have everything handed to her. And she's, you know, I don't either, I think she's probably getting older. I think she's maybe an aging starlet. Oh, yeah. Who's, who's realizing, you know, she's not having anything handed to her anymore. Um, I, I mean, I thought this was the traditional ballad, really, you know, where, you know, she's giving up that love and letting go, letting her go live her life while still being condescending at the same time. Possibly. <laughs> um, the chorus is, um, Pauline is beautiful. The world can give her everything, well, huh? Pauline is beautiful, expects the world to give her everything. Pauline, yeah. um, I can't remember, something I'll, I'll expects the world to lay down at her feet, uh, flowers yeah. for the queen. Um, and it, it just kind of has a Hollywood feel to it. I was getting kind of a starlet, starlet vibe. Um, love the line, paper sky peels off the wall. Uh, Cammy's lyrics are impressionist, I'll say. Not, okay. quite, not quite abstract like Michael Stipe, yeah. where it's like, what the fuck is he talking about? I, I know, always know what she's talking about, but she finds very clever ways of saying it. Um, love the groove. It's it's very led by the drums. Again, McMahon yeah. is amazing. Um, nice timing change in the chorus. There's just some you know, nice subtle timing, you know, timing work done on the song. Great atonal cello work in the second verse. Jerry Sudiak, who played on their last two releases, um, rest in peace. Because I, I, from what I've read, she passed away the same year this was put out from cancer. Oh yeah. Um, at least one source says that. Um, and uh, she does some really interesting things because she doesn't play. I mean, sometimes she plays conventional parts, but sometimes she's just making noise, <laughs> and she does it really well. And they throw a lot of effects on her, and it, it's just. It doesn't sound like it's what you would expect from a cello. Um, and the background vocals in, in the second chorus just get, almost kind of overtake Cammy. <laughs> like the, it's just this wall of vocals, which I love when they get to that second chorus. And the, the bridge is a great example of, of um, Tom, Jim Thomas's minimalism. He plays like four notes. It's all, you know, the vo it's all vocals, bass, and drums. Right. Jim just plays like four notes, but they sit perfectly. Um, and her, her vocals at the ending, or toward the end, when it just builds. Cammy again, great loss to music that she's not singing professional anymore, because she has an amazing voice. The thing she, the dynamic she can pull off with her voice are incredible. It's, uh, it could just be the, the way the music business went, you know? Yeah. Well, yeah, I'm. I'm. I don't want to speculate. There was no reason given. Well, no, no re reasons other than what I said. That I mean, let's, just, let's be honest. It is harder to make a living at mm -hmm. this if you're um, not on the top of of and the mountain. You know. The thing is, they got a huge break from Joss Whedon. He put them in an episode of Buffy. He gave yeah. them a the theme song to a national t a TV show that lasted five years. Yeah. He, Joss Whedon gave them a huge break. I don't know if they really knew how to capitalize on it. Well, that I think, uh, and I even saw people feel the same way that I do about this. And I only had expectations coming in because of the one song that you mm -hmm. uh, played for me. I mean, I had kind of an expectation that it was going to be. I just for those who might know it, I played um, "I Want to Kill You" from the Kill You EP last week after we recorded. Right. So you know, you go into this, and I'm expecting some, you know, gothic, you know, mm -hmm. overlay. And instead, I feel I kind of got the Partridge family in some tracks. <laughs> you know, I mean, interesting. Um, it's, I mean, it's good. It's just not what, what I was expecting. And then I saw, like, I think somebody had on their review, like, you know, that that was into their music from, mm -hmm. you know, Angel and stuff. They were expecting the same thing, and then they're like, "Wait, what?" <laughs> well, yeah, the Angel theme is all cello. Um, Cammy just sings some Oz here and there. And it's very dark and you know gothic, and they do the gothic thing here and there. But yeah, you they, know, I've I, never watched an episode. So yeah, no you were never gotten. That. You were never a fan of the Buffy verse. That's why I was yeah. explaining it to you because I know you've never seen it. I yeah. don't think you've ever seen an episode of Buffy either. No, I don't think I have. Yeah. So that's, that's why I was yeah. explaining what it is. Um, but what I, where, where I was going with you know they got this huge break from Joss, and I don't know if they ever really played much outside of L.A. Right, and then you see like the album cover and everything on this too. You think you're getting like this like heavy goth, you know, dark thing. And I mean, <laughs> it, it was a lot, you know, there, there are some morbid, you know, mm -hmm. morbidity to the ballads, 
See, but I, a lot of it is just you know i mean when you when you start bringing the horns in it's kind of like um wait what's this <laughs> yeah, i like that versatility i like that they don't just do the gothic thing they go in a lot of different directions and from their previous releases they've always done that they've and, always had a lot of versatility in their music but you know the band this they really remind me of more than anybody else and it's uh it's kind of funny and maybe it's just because we reviewed them last week but Pearl Jam. Me a lot of Pearl Jam. That's <laughs> interesting. Because I mean, I could see Eddie singing a lot of these songs. I mm-hmm. mean, they would have a different sound to him. It would be a baritone instead oh, yeah, of, of that that higher register. But and I could see her singing a Pearl Jam song easily too, mm-hmm. in her own way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and and yeah, just that that want not wanting to do one thing. Right. Which I mean, Pearl Jam was very right. has very vehemently said that you know, yeah. they didn't want to be in a punk band you know right. in one they, when i was 10 years old and they didn't want to keep, do it now they didn't want to keep making 10 even though it was hugely popular right they which, could have made 10 four more times and then would have made and know. which as much as i prefer 10 to the rest of this stuff i, I deeply re- respect yeah that they, did they left something the money different. on the table and said yeah. fuck you this is what we're going to put out as our lead singer right <laughs> but yeah that's what these guys kind of did mm-hmm. like yeah. they could have played the goth i mean at least for their first album they probably yeah. should have stuck with it a bit more but anyway on back to the album on to track five another interlude the paper sky um just a nice great nice uh bass and uh synth bass and drum groove a little bit of real bass really nice really nice kind of flanged middle section ends with some kind of 80 sounding keys just a nice little short groove yeah and that really th- this is probably the first one where i was like "Ooh, this really isn't working because over the next track is a great companion to Pauline mm-hmm. a- and would have been even more effective, I think, without the interlude. You're right. Yeah, up. I'm thinking about it. See, I know the album too well. I, I know with the. With you expect the interludes. the interludes to be there. You're accustomed right. to those interludes being there yeah. once you've but listened to it a number Thinking of times. about the end of Pauline into the beginning of the next mm-hmm. one, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, and this is track six, Over You. This is another one of my favorites. Um, love how it opens with just bass and cello and a little bit of percussion. And this is definitely Ada. Uh, there are certain songs on, on the album that I know he played on because he, he was on the previous two albums or releases, the EPs. And I just, he has a very unique style. I um, love the interplay between the cello and the bass. And this is basically a rock song, but with all acoustic guitars. Yeah, this is a lot more standard ballad, I feel, than, than Pauline, where Pauline was <laughs> <laughs> like in, in its own planet, you know, <laughs> where this is, they just, they dialed it down even more. This is really a straight ahead rock song, just all mm-hmm. acoustic, which is a little different. Um, love how delicate Cami is on the verses. She can, she can kind of like verge on a whisper, beautifully. Yeah. Um, and I love the line: "You you wait for an excuse to sleep to sleep away your either evolution or revolution." I'm never not really sure. Yeah. Evolution, I think, makes a little more sense. Um, and then she does another great job of that in the bridge, where she goes from the whisper just builds up to this shout. Um, if it's a straight ahead rock song, I won't get over you this time. Is the is the hook yeah. about you know a failed relationship? I almost wondered if they were doing a Jeff Buckley reference because there's a line, "How do you like the lilac wine over there?" Oh, it may have been a reference, yeah. And and I, I started interpreting it as you know someone lost in a different way. You know, someone mm-hmm. passed on. Okay, that they can't get over losing. How do you, how do you like the know. lilac wine over there on the other side? Yeah. I, yeah. huh. <laughs> I, I mean, I don't know. That, yeah, I, I don't know if a lot of the, I, I can't pull a lot of lyrics off, uh, you know, to mind offhand. Um, but I don't know if a lot of it makes sense with that. But maybe. Um, but yeah, when I first heard it, it was like, oh, yeah, you're just getting over someone in a relationship. But then when I heard the lilac wine over there, I was kind of like, oh, what if it's somebody passing on? You know, sometimes, you know, there are breakup songs you think are breakup yeah, songs, true, but true. it's really about someone. Right passed on <laughs> we ran into one of those recently where i yeah um the um the other way around uh with the one on the big wreck album one of the songs i thought was about death and <laughs> was probably just about a breakup just, yeah so yeah, yeah fucker you're dead to me <laughs> <laughs> on to track seven um no interlude this time uh, another full song just of mine um really nice time to go really soft and here's where we get some partridge family <laughs> Start off with acoustic guitar with some horns. I thought the horns were a really nice touch on this song. Yeah, I don't know if I dig the horns on these. (laughs) 
Because it's just something different to move, mix in with the acoustic guitars. You don't expect it, right? You don't expect it, but I'm not sure if I get mm-hmm. if I if I dig it. <laughs> just a really nice soft ballad um, with this really surprising lap steel that comes in in the in the chorus. It just gets really big. This was actually the first one where I'm like, hey, these guys sound a lot like Pearl Jam in some way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I can definitely hear this as a Pearl Jam song. Yeah, <laughs> you know, just the voice, the subtle guitar work, you know. And then you get that unexpected musical direction. That, mm-hmm. I mean, I don't think Pearl Jam's done horns yet, but I could see them doing yeah. that soon. And just this big steel guitar coming in and just distorting the, this chorus, you know, going to this big chorus, I thought was a nice touch. Um, just a little side note, um, on the, the title on the ripped CD, the last E is missing. Oh, yeah? Just weird little typo. I just I thought I'd mention it. Yeah, that is a weird okay <laughs> i actually had to check the back of the cd itself the jewel case to make sure it wasn't it was spelled with an e at the end um okay on to the next interlude fifth and 34th just some guy talking about getting directions with a piano in the background doesn't really make any sense um on to track nine bardo barbituate this one took a long time to grow on me in fact i'm only just getting into it this was originally one of the tracks that i was skipped I was trying to figure out who she was doing vocally. Cause I mean, you know, there's some of that where, you know, <laughs> there's I'll, certainly influences. And, and, you know, after we reviewed Pearl Jam last week, I was kind of wondering why the fuck do I like these guys so much? And, you know, kind of went through their catalog and realized Vetter is this actor. Mm-hmm. Like he plays roles and she does the same thing in this. Oh, definitely, too. definitely. And, uh, it took me a while, but I'm thinking she's doing Cindy Lauper here. Interesting. Which is an excellent yeah, choice, of course. Yeah, if yeah. there's anybody vocally you want to do yeah, yeah, yeah. It, for for a woman, Cindy mm-hmm. Lauper is a really good one to go with, <laughs> and very unexpected too, especially in 03. And this song is just beautifully off kilter. Love the fretless bass, and the vocal gives me chills. At the point where she's just on that verge of a whisper. I'm trying to, yeah, I'm trying to decide if this is my favorite or if there's still one more to go. Mm-hmm. This is but yeah, it's definitely up favorite. there for me. Yeah. Love the kind of pseudo-military drums that he puts in. It's this really off-kilter song with this fretless bass and this whispered vocal, and Steve is just playing a military part. It's definitely my favorite vocal performance of hers. In Interesting. This. Yeah. Not what I expected. From- Maybe not my favorite song on the album, <laughs> but but definitely... Okay. Her vocals are, are the best here, I think. And, and um, the, there's two really interesting guitar parts on the chorus, because it goes big on the chorus again. And one is this big distorted wall of sound, and the other is this flanged guitar that just plays a, does, plays a little riff next to it. We've set each other off beautifully. We've got another guitar solo. The sec- we're, on, we're halfway through the album, he's played two. <laughs> <laughs> I think these guys were really in the forefront of that no guitar solos movement that kind of yeah. came in in the 2000s. That Jello was always a uh, profound, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he never liked them. Well, <laughs> there were always bands who didn't do them, but you they know. did them, but he, yeah. he didn't really like them. Right. But in the 2000s, there was kind of a movement to get away from guitar solos. You know, after grunge and hair metal, the, the rock bands kind of said, okay, we're not doing that anymore. <laughs> Which is kind of weird. It could be why rock <laughs> is dying. Because <laughs> I mean, a guitar solo is a pretty important part of it. I would say, as let a, it loose, man. As a guitar solo player, I, I, I won't necessarily disagree with the importance of solos. Um, yeah, but there's a great kind of flanged effect on the vocal in this one, and they don't put a lot of effects on Cammy's voice. So when they do right. it, it's a real it it brings out some interesting tones. Um, the solo kind of comes back again over the last verse, which I thought was a nice touch. It's, it kind of restates that melody because the solo isn't just, you know, blowing his cookies. All of his solos are, are very melodic and planned out, um, which it works nice behind some vocals. And she just really belts the last chorus. You know, as, as much as I'm talking about her whispering, when right. she belts, she really fucking belts. She goes really high, too, in this. Yeah. Um, on to track 10, Say You Love Me. This is another one that is, is still taking a long time to grow on me. Lots of ballads. Yeah. They almost, I think they were really pushing their luck with that. I mean, you don't want to get too, too many. 
I think there there should be a limit well, sometimes if you're a rock band. Yeah, yeah. Well, they were. I, I would never have thought to compare them to Pearl Jam, but that was really apropos. They're doing what they want, which could be part of why they never really made it. Um, this is I like what I thought of is I've probably listened more to this in the last week than I had previously. Yeah, that, this and Bardo uh, Bardo Barbiturate. Because those were always the two songs I skipped. Um, I'm starting to really like them. And I've taken to calling this one the David Lynch song. <laughs> well, they take... This one is like super traditional standard and give it a more darker feel to it. It's a very traditional, very kind of 50s song. Yeah. But it's really creepy and off-kilter. And beautifully right. creepy. That's, that is exactly it. You know, it's it's... I don't know how they did it, but they they took a very traditional song, and I don't know if it's her vocals or Jim's guitar playing, or I think there's a synth playing a really kind of dis dissonant chord in the background, very subtly, but they just make it make your you know shoulders go up with this traditional '50s love song. <laughs> well, right, and and it's a it's about believability. I mean, it's about being an actor or actress, <laughs> where I mean. You know, when it was Diana Ross and, you know, Baby Love, you know, you can hear that that pain in her voice where like Michael Bolton, and, right? Yeah. And he's singing, you know, how am I supposed <laughs> to live without you? Yeah. Make makes it sound like he, he makes it sound like, oh, who's going to pick up my dry cleaning now kind yeah, of yeah. thing? Not I'm going to fucking die. You know, right, he sounds yeah, yeah. whiny, whereas I've, here she puts it in that that mm -hmm. this could be it right i would with Bolton, i would go more to uh since it was his first big hit dock of the bay and you can really compare him to otis redding and holy fuck no who i i mean how that was even a hit yeah no. why even would think of doing that like oh yeah he has all this emotional pain and expression and mm -hmm. for just the simple act and here i'm just going to be as dull and white bread as humanly well, possible. And, and I mean, we're tangenting because that's what we do. But I'm hitting the notes. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that's all that matters. Bolton belts everything. There's no yeah. subtlety. Right. Otis Redding could belt, but Doc of the Bay was a beautifully subtle performance for him. Oh, yeah. There's I mean, no, he doesn't scream. He doesn't belt that song. It's just he's resigned to his life. That's what the song right. is about. Oh, yeah. It's, it's, you know, wandering aimlessly. It's <laughs> just like. I guess this is what I'm doing now. Fuck. <laughs> you know, I mean, there's so much subtext in what he yeah. does when you hear him singing. Oh, yeah. it's singing it. Right, of course. Michael Bolton is just like, I'm hitting notes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really loud. Can you hear me singing this loudly? <laughs> that, that's very nice, Michael. Yeah. Why are you shouting? <laughs> right. And and back to say you love me. The actor, yeah. the actor thing is apropos because somehow she decided to go creepy. And I don't know exactly what she did that was creepy. You know, I can't nail down what is creepy about the song. Right. I it's think just it's... The, the, the culmination of everything just is. Ugh. And I really wish sometimes I was better versed in the language of music mm -hmm. and what they're doing here I, that makes it that, that I am, gives it the creepiness. I am, pretty, even. I am pretty well versed in the language of music and I haven't been able to put it together for 16 yeah. years. So I think it's the, 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 the whispered vocals and i'm sure there's a dissonant synthesizer back there doing yeah. something um on to track 11 come and now for something completely different candy jones this could be my uh my favorite for the, for uh -huh. the pick i mean it's either this or the first track uh -huh. okay not not bar oh bar 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 you're talking about not the uh, first track smaller god or this okay. well but you've I got time to decide <laughs> I think for an obituary, I think I like the vocal performance better than this song. Speaking of which, I think you need to catch up on your best of playlist. Yeah, like you have recently. I thought I'd been putting it in as I okay. go along. I had I looked at it a, a few weeks ago, and you missed a few weeks. But oh. unless you've caught up since then, which is possible. Anyway, Candy Jones. It's a song about a spy, and it's just this frenetic drum line, this great you know melodic bass part, and a really playful vocal. With two slide guitars, I, right. think, I think one is Jim, one is Ben Peeler on each side, because one is a conventional guitar. He he hits frets here occasionally, which a lap steel isn't going to do because a lap steel doesn't have frets. 
So it's Jim playing as Les Paul that isn't set up for slide with a slide on one side and probably Ben Peeler on the lap steel on the other. And it's identical parts, just a split second away from each other. It could be the most Pearl Jam-like song on the whole album, actually. <laughs> That's another interest, <laughs> and you're. I'm not, I'm not going to argue because you know Pearl Jam far better than I do. I just well, think, never would think about like Hail Hail and how they were yeah. playing two different parts at the same time, right. kind okay. of, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and going with it. Or Red Mosquito, where they're having the dialogue between you know him right. and Mosquito. Yeah. <laughs> and and I, I love the the di bass dyads going into the the solo. He, it's this descending part, and dyad is two notes played at the same time. Yeah, which you never hear on a bass. Line. It's an absolute kick-ass bass line. But I really think as a band, they're at their top of their game on this one, which is mm -hmm. probably why it's also my favorite track mm -hmm. on it. And I love Cammy's laughs and sighs during the, the, the solo. <laughs> She's just having a blast. Because it's this, this spy who is just kind of flirting with you know her, her nemesis. Right. And it, it's, it's a really fun song. On to track 12, Skitter. This is the only interlude that I don't like because it's it's this drum and synth bass thing, and there's just this ear splitting high note at the beginning. <laughs> I mean, this is genius for the era of Spotify because you know how many extra plays they're getting and how many, <laughs> you know, if it goes for thirty seconds or more, they yeah, it's yeah. credited as a track. Like a decade before Spotify existed. Yeah, they somehow do. Who do? <laughs> On to track thirteen, second skin. This is my favorite. This yeah. is the only song from the album that I've listened to regularly since 20, 2003. Um, love the drum line. This is this is my favorite thing that Steve McMahon has ever played. Um, and it, it's a great, mostly whispered vocal. Yeah. And, and the bass groove is definitely Addo. Because he's just following the chords, but the rhythm he gives to it just drives the song perfectly. Um, love the, the belted note at the end of the first verse. Um, it's basically, it's a love song, but it's about just desperately needing the person you're in love with. Um, and this is where Brett's, Brett Levick's vocal comes in on the chorus. <laughs> Eat that Bowie background vocal. <laughs> it's kind of Bowie now that you mention it. He sings the, he sings the chorus an octave down from Cammy. Right. Um, and it's, or maybe two octaves. Um, and it's, to me, it always sounded like Leonard Cohen. I think he were, I guess, Liam or, Lynch's Bowie. <laughs> Leonard Cohen, or maybe a wizard with a hot guitar. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, Leonard Cohen, or maybe Nick Cave. Some, you know, it's it's that kind of thing. Um, love the additional percussion in verse two. Um, he just brings in the second percussion part. He could have played them both at the same time. I'm not sure. Um, it just adds this little extra to the group, bit to the um, the uh, groove. And this is a great example of Jim's weird minimalism again, because again, on the verses, he just plays four notes. Wait for waits a couple bars, plays yeah. four notes, but it fits the song beautifully. Oh yeah, I think if there weren't as many ballads on this album, this probably would have stood out more for me. Uh -huh. But I think we're like what at least in our fourth or fifth ballad by this point. So I'll, kind of... I'll give you an idea of how much I love this song. I was in a very very problematic relationship in two thousand five. You know who I'm talking about? Oh boy, <laughs> this was our song. Fortunately, I was already in love with the song. <laughs> uh, Fortunately, I was already in love with the song before I met her, and I still love it in spite of that relationship. I I was first laughing because I was just thinking of the joke of what sick fuck comes up with the skit killing their girl ex girlfriend over and over again, uh, and then, and then you, this was your Me. song. This yes. Well, it's a beautiful love song. You taken? It's a beautiful love song. If you the, the lyrics aren't dark at all. Okay. The lyrics are just about needing that person that you the person you love. Um, your your brilliance and beauty has got me reeling in sunlight and shadows. I believe you set me free. You set me free. Okay. It's, it's a beautiful love song in terms of the lyrics. It's just is kind of creepy in terms of the way it's played. <laughs> I mean, second sin skin uh, connotates. Uh... No, it's, it's image of, of yeah, a snake yeah, yeah. No, shedding their skin and it's their new skin. Um, it, it, the, I think it's kind of uh, uh, the, the idea is kind of also shown in the line. Um, I look at my reflection, I see yours instead. Uh, it's that right. we're inhabiting the same space. Um, yeah. You know, um, show, uh, show me your beautiful flaws and tell me how you got each scar. 
It's it's kind of it's a little creepy, but it's very sh straightforward yeah. love song. Um, and then on the bridge, Cammy decides to start scatting. <laughs> it's just a scat vocal with this really sparse guitar, great melodic bass again. And the chorus comes back, and she just belts the hell out of it this time. Uh, on to track 14, Benediction. This is my weakest. It feels a lot more new wave. It's really just a conventional rock song. It's kind of a, she gets a little Gwen Stefani yeah, doing yeah, the talk yeah. talk here. Right, yeah. There's an odd clicking sound just before the bass comes in that sounds like a cassette door being closed. Yeah, yeah, I noticed I, that too. I've never <laughs> been able to figure out what that is. Or I thought it was just a door opening. I I don't yeah, know. Or closing. Uh, I, I don't know. It's just mm -hmm. a weird. A door yeah, closing it, makes sense with the lyrics because it's about bad relationship, you know. I uh, I thought it was I. Right. You you'll never hurt me again, you know. With this big, the chorus is the most rock thing, and I and I'm spelling that R A W K. Yeah. Thing that Jim ever played. Um, yeah, that's I, I that's spelled the, eight with two I's yeah. instead of an yeah. L and an R. That spelling that's of rock. Hip. That's spelling of rock is is one of their things they did on the forums when they would talk about <laughs> rock music because they didn't play rock music. Yeah, it was a joke. This is a rock song. Um, incidentally, I think I have probably on Zombie Takeout quoted a slogan of theirs. Um, oh yeah, that I've I've always uh, always loved. Um, dar their slogan was "Darling Violetta." Not for everyone because what's for everyone is boring. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, this is just a class. It's, Standard rock song, my weakest. Um, on to Space Mine, or sorry, Space Mime. I actually thought it was Space Mine until I, took, I noticed it last night. Oh. Space Mime. <laughs> and it's just a voice in French with some radio interference. On to track 16, Beautiful. This is a very close second to my favorite. She goes a little Bjork here, huh? Yeah, yeah, I can hear that. Um, it's drum and bass percussion that I'm pretty sure was edited together. Steve didn't just play it live. Um, I don't think you could play this live. But With... I think the the delicate viewer oh, yeah, really yeah, I sets it. up. I think it really sets up yeah. that when she gets aggressive on it, mm -hmm. and and it really makes it better. But it's this drum and bass dr drum part, you know, the, that genre drum and bass, the dance music genre, with this affected acoustic guitar. And these synths, the bass comes in a little, a little bit in the beginning, and I don't, you don't hear the bass the rest of the song. This is the one where she's doing a different character too, right? Like towards the end, or am I confusing this with another? That with another? I don't think. I don't think it's this one. I mean, um, I think it's the same character. It's about again a failed relationship. Yeah. Um, but um, she again whispers it in kind yeah. of a creepy way. Um, Oh, I'm trying to think where she kind of goes a little, she almost goes a little slipper man. <laughs> okay. Um, and there's some great kind of periodic kind of interference and distortion on the vocal, which again, just makes your shoulders come up. Um, love the line. You're running out of promises. I'm running out of innocence. <laughs> and it's, it's just about someone who, you know, she thought she would be with, and it just didn't went nowhere. Um, you know, if you weren't ever coming back, why didn't you just tell me that dressed in sex and stardust lies, subconscious yeah. dreams are so unkind. Um, and then the she gets much more forceful on the chorus. Uh, where is she singing that? Yeah, I did like this one overall. Yeah. Another great line. Icicle dreams are the memories gone by. Have you ever seen a lullaby on fire? <laughs> yeah, I thought that's what she said. Yeah. And... I think lullaby. There's some in, there's some references to youth, but I think lullaby in the sense is the hope of the relationship is what she you know lulls herself to sleep with, um, and the, when she sings on fire, her vocal is amazing. Yeah, she screams that line. It's the most controlled scream I've ever heard. <laughs> uh, just terrifying, and she hits some amazing high notes at the end. You That's said you went high earlier. They shouldn't have been afraid of the 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 rock, you know, because I mean she's got a voice that's very suited mm -hmm. for it. Yeah. But the high notes she hits at the end are amazing. And at the very end, the song just slows down. And I don't mean the band slows down. They took the recording and very quickly slowed it. Yeah. Which I loved. It's just this off-kilter ending that you don't expect. I use that a lot. This I think I use that expression a lot this time. <laughs> and it fits the band. And finally, the final interlude, Enough Rope to Hang Yourself. <laughs> Fitting for your take on the interludes. Um, yeah. It's just synth and electric uh, drums with some odd vocals. I think it's just chatter from the studio. 
Right, exactly. It was kind of like a, oh, this really was just leftovers they strung yeah. together. <laughs> I was like, that's what I thought in the first place. On to track 18, Star Shoes, Love is Everything, the last song. Just a nice big mid t- mid tempo ballad love song, very beatly, especially I, on the cor- on the pre chorus. <sighs> yeah, not a fan of this one. I'd say she's their most Susie Sue here. Uh-huh. Uh, she's at her most Susie Sue, but the whole psychedelic thing. No, it's a nice song. <laughs> um, the lyrics are great. I love the references to Dolly uh, and Monet. I thought lyrically, it's it's pretty much almost like a Ruddle song, you know, where it's like love is everywhere and love well, is... Well, that's the chorus. <laughs> yeah, but it's the... repeated a lot. Yeah, that's the chorus, which is a little boring, but on, on the verses, there are references to, to uh, Gala and Dali, um, Monet's Viola Snow. There's some nice references in the in the verses. Yeah. Um, the bridge is just classic Spar Star on Violetta. Um, love the interplay uh, toward the end between the lead and the background vocal. And the song is kind of unintentionally prophetic. The last line of the song is, this is my last song. <laughs> the last song on what turned out to be their last album. And as far as I know, the last thing Cammy sang professionally. Wow. So yeah, it just kind of turned out to be interestingly prophetic. And I love, as everything fades out at the end, you're left with this hum that you don't hear until then, but it was probably there for the entire song. Right. Um. So, would you recommend it? Easily, yeah, yeah, very much so. I mean, I think there's... They don't make it easy for you to like it, but... <laughs> they, well, you have to love a band that challenges you, though. They, they, they bury the gems in a lot, of, a lot of waste. I think I would, you know, make a playlist without the interludes. Well, the interludes, the, well, yeah. The interludes, I definitely see your point. I'm just used and to them. see how and it goes. They were, it was a great what the fuck at the time. Um, <laughs> and uh, also, I mean... There were a lot of ballads, so I don't know which one I would do away with, you know, because mm-hmm. I don't think I listened to it enough to make that kind of call. It's interesting that you're doing you would do away with a ballad, and I would do away with the rock song. <sighs> you, you, I mean, unless you're you're into that scene, well, actually, you should and, not be doing that many ballads. And I actually wouldn't do away with Benediction. I like the song. I just think it's the weakest on the album. I do listen to it now and then. Um, and for me, it's one of my favorite albums. I, this Doing this review gave me a chance to fall back in love with it. So, of course, I strenuously recommend it. Yeah. I just, the fact that three quarters of this band are no longer making music professionally is such a loss because, you know, Jim is the first person in 20 years to influence me as a guitar player. Uh, Cammy has an incredible chameleon like voice, and McManus is one of the greatest drummers of all time. But yeah, I think. It was after I listened to it the first time, and I think I was looking up, like, uh, I forgot where I saw the review. I think it was on Amazon. Someone was just like, this wasn't, you know, <laughs> what I signed up for. <laughs> if you had listened to Bathwater Flowers and the Kill You EP, it would have been what you signed up for, because they've always had a, a really wide variety on their their stuff. If you're well, just coming from Angel, which is where I came from initially, from Angel, yeah, and I was a little surprised that they had all of these layers, but I liked that. But I mean, I think you made a mistake by playing me the song you you played for me last week because it was very like I mean that was leading to I mean that was the straight up doors fucking chaos you know Mm -hmm. I you know I want to kill you you know Mm -hmm. and And I was expecting the shiny happy people here and I well let's give them a little more credit than that. Um, and the reason I played you for that one is because I was kind of, I was very tempted to review the Kill You EP instead of Parlor, but really just for that song, because I, I yeah. really wanted to get your reaction to that song, because it is so left field and, and interesting. And that is it for Parlor by Darling and Violetta. Until next time, and we'll be reviewing Rhinoceros by Calva Louise. They're a very new band. In fact, as we're recording this, th- their first album, Rhinoceros, was just released last Friday. Um... And they only released three singles before that that are on Rhinoceros. So I can't even give you a preview of that one. Well. There's a, a great Spotify ad right now. But like, have you ever heard of this band? They they wear masks and they sing backwards and they haven't even heard of themselves yet. <laughs> nice. <laughs> That's kind of like where we're at, man. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, I just love that we're now bringing in a, a new band after yeah. you know, so much 90s stuff. And even this was 2003, <laughs> so it's bordering on 90s. Um, yeah. 
the joke last year was, are we ever going to get out of the 80s? Because we did like two or three 80s albums we in a row. We did do a lot of 80s last year, didn't we? Well, no, we only did. We did a few in a row, which is what that started that joke. Is are we ever going to yeah. do anything out from the 80s? We really didn't touch the 80s after that. Now we're starting <laughs> with a bunch of 90s stuff. And it's kind of, I, I guess every year we're going to step forward a decade. Um, <laughs> But a very, very new band. Um, I think this is, again, going to be the most... This will be the most recent album we've reviewed. It has to be. Bandmade was the previous holder. We did that three weeks after it was released. I think it's wow. like two weeks. Anyway, until then, of course, always remember, never forget, wherever you go in life, there you there are. There you are.